All right, this is the Evan Ginsberg Show at VillageConnectionRadio.com. And this is role reversal because 30 years ago, John Arezzi was interviewing me on his show. Now I'm interviewing John, so we've come full cycle, full circle. And uh, John Arezzi is back in the wrestling scene, and uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Evan. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate your invitation to come on. And uh, I saw you at WrestleCon, and it's been a reunion. I hadn't seen you in ages. Well, I've been gone for 23 years. 23 years. Yeah, I just wow. disappeared from the wrestling business in 96. You you are very, very early one of the first guys to do wrestling radio, one of the first guys to do conventions. So my big question would be, did you come too early? Because I remember like Johnny Valiant telling me he never made big money in the business because he missed that boom cycle. You know, he was a main event wrestler back in 74, 75. Oh, yeah, I was a big fan. Oh, yeah, the Valiants were tremendous. Yes. But he missed that big money. Like, I was at WrestleCon, and you're talking 450 bucks a table, 40 yes. bucks a pop, people yes. walking in, thousands and thousands of people. Right. It's big money. Yes, it is. And But you came maybe a bit too one. early. Right. I was the first one. I was kind of a, uh, you know, a lot of people have called me a pioneer. Oh, yeah. You know, with the tearing down the curtain of a, of a radio show that kind of talk to everybody out of character uh and then the wrestling fan conventions the idea was to kind of for the first time give the fans an opportunity to connect with the wrestlers on a more intimate level because that's never that was never done before because right. of kayfabe you had you had like the wfia things earlier yes. but it wasn't the same thing no i mean exactly. wfia was an organization right and uh it was kind of like hardcore fans and, and the awards that were given, it was kind of like a banquet to right. finalize it. It was a fans organization that had a few hundred members. Uh, the wrestling fans convention idea was kind of modeled after baseball card shows. Yeah. And I was like, I think there's a market for it. But I was too early in the game because wrestling, when I did these conventions, and the first one was 1990, and I stopped at the end of 93, I believe, um, wrestling was in a very dark period of time. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, it, the popularity had sunk because of the scandals and uh, the cartoon characters that were being developed rather than... And the wrestling itself was lousy. Right, WWE, so right? I, I came way too early. But I think, I, and, and what I did, which was uh, not the very best business move in the world, um, it was uh, over-delivering. You know, when you bring Ric Flair, Buddy Rogers, Bruno, Luthez, Billy Graham, Rick Rude, and so many at these conventions, I, I never stop booking the guys because I get a call, like a Johnny V, hey, I'd love to do it. Yeah, yeah. And then you can't say no. Right. So I didn't make any money on all any of them. Wow. So it was uh, kind of an education, and I, I wasn't, you know, on the radio stuff too. I mean, today... You know, you have shows on Sirius XM, you have radio shows everywhere. But when I did it, you had to broker your time. You had to buy your time. So it was a constant hustle for me. Yeah. What kind of advertisers, who can I get to keep me on the air? And it was a struggle for six years. Hmm. So 30 years later, though, yeah. I would think some of the memorabilia, like I bought a uh, original chic signed picture on a plaque. Yes. I would think this stuff has high value now. So... I, I would think you could make some of that money back at this point. Uh, well, basically, I, I don't have any of that stuff anymore. Really? That's thirty years ago. Really? I mean, I sold it wow. uh, at the conventions, That's and, too bad. and then I'd you know sell it after the fact, and so I don't have any any of that stuff at all. I have a few autographs for myself, but uh, I was at a wrestling fans convention yesterday, uh, '80s Wrestling Con in New Jersey. So they invited me because they wanted to give me a lifetime achievement award. Show the plaque. I got a little plaque here. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Yeah. It's the Convention Promoter Champions Award. And it was one of my listeners. He was 16 years old at the time, 30 years ago. And uh, he wanted to do a convention That in makes Jersey. him 46. That I makes him 46. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So he uh, he was just one of my listeners, and he wanted to do a convention. And I put him on my show. I was Tommy happy. Fierro? Tommy Fierro. Yeah, I know Tommy. And, uh, and when I dipped my toe back in in November of this past year, uh, he reached out to me, told me he was doing a convention. He says, I would be honored if you would show up because I'd like to give you an award because if it wasn't for you uh, I wouldn't have done this wow. and I, and this and even yesterday I was on stage with uh, the nasty boys and and Rocky Johnson and uh, bushwhacker Luke and and Lanny Poffo and and he brings me on stage to give me this award and I'm like well it really wouldn't have happened without these boys back there because that's what fans want to connect with and see yeah. so me coming back 
30 years later and you giving me this award is really, it means a lot to me. That's great. It's, it's always nice to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. um, I find that in wrestling, it, it's, it's this weird perception like scoops and information yeah. is not necessarily writing. Some, some of the wrestling journalists are not great writers. It's information. Yes. There are quality, quality writers like Mike Mooneyham. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain guys. So the perception, guys like yourself who, who paved the way for this, who, this is a big business now. It is. And, you know, you took the hit. You took the well, hit. Well, I, I got in and I got in that timing for me. I got out right before the Attitude Era, right before it kind of exploded again. Yeah. So I got out. But, you know, what I'm, why I'm coming back today is because uh, I've been in Nashville for 20 years. I've been in the music business. I'm, I'm getting a little bit kind of discouraged with the way the entire music business is today. It's changed dramatically. And you're, was, you're rolling your eyes. Uh, this is an arts program, not necessarily a wrestling program. Tell us why. Well, I mean, it's uh, the labels aren't doing artist development anymore. Mm. And the artists are more wanting to be stars than they are artists. Uh, so country music in the industry that I'm in is so homogenized now that everything sounds the same. I yeah. mean, years ago you could say well this is a George Strait song this is a Brad Paisley song this is a Patti Loveless song I mean and women don't get played on country radio so I mean that's a why big why is that sexism uh, well I believe uh, there's a big part of that I believe mm -hmm. it's just uh, uh, you know there's only 15% of any country music playlist are women and that's only Carrie Underwood it's Miranda Lambert uh, it is uh, Kelsey Ballerini who I discovered actually uh, and, and just a few others that uh, Marin Morris and a few others they get airplay, but the other women uh, they don't get the opportunity. And what I do in Nashville is I do artist development. I have a, a company called Bantwango uh, dot com, and we take emerging artists, discovery acts, and we work with them and mentor them and kind of teach them what's going on in the business today because labels are not signing acts anymore. Other than that, you know, they look at the analytics. How many streams does this artist have? Yeah. I mean, what is the engage? What is the fan engagement on Instagram? I know. I mean, so yeah. they're not out in the clubs and right. they're not not honing doing their craft. What they're supposed to do. Yeah. So my company has become this feeder system, where we put them through a process and we crowdfund for them, whether it's an EP or a video, or if they need promotion help or marketing help, or and then we we take the really good ones and try to get them deals. Yeah. Uh, so it's a unique concept, but what I'm discovering now, it's like. Um, it's just the whole dynamic of the business from the labels to down to the artists who are all scrambling. It's not becoming, it's becoming not a fun business anymore. Yeah. yeah. And then I go back to wrestling now because I, I'm, I'm like, all right, you know, I'm a few years away from retirement. I got 45 years of content that people have never seen before. Yeah. Of course, they've heard radio shows, but most of the fans haven't because they're, you know, it's a whole new generation. Generate, sure. So yeah. I'm going back in now uh, on a nostalgia play, uh, which uh, you know, which starts with a podcast called Pro Wrestling Spotlight Then and Now that'll be launching within the next thirty days. We're hey, gonna where, go. Where, where can we hear that? What's that? Where can we? Hear uh, that? You can hear it anywhere you get your podcast from oh, iTunes okay. on down, and it's uh, uh, pwspod.com is where you subscribe to it. And we're going to go back in time thirty years to talk about what radio shows and what guests were on back then and then hopefully bring some of these people back to talk about what happened 30 years ago but we'll also unearth audio that has never been heard from all the interviews i did at madison square garden as a reporter wow. in the early 70s from don leo jonathan pedro morales bruno andre all grand wizard lou albano all the heels that yeah, they this managed has, this has great value today yeah. because the vast majority are gone I did 3 a.m. radio, WBA. Well, I remember it. I solicited. 99.5. I had on Sherry Martel. Mm -hmm. She was talking how over 15 years she didn't see her son grow up because she yeah. was on the road. I had um, Lou Thez one New yes. Year's Eve. I had Freddie Blassie. I, I'll never forget, I had Eddie Guerrero sobbing a few weeks after the death of Art Bar. I just heard that interview. Ironically, I listened to it. I have it really? on cassette. Wow. I wow. mean that was a that was a that was an impactful interview. I mean he was sobbing on yes. air. I'll never forget yes. it. And uh, 
There were times I would just sit there and like look out the window, and there's New York at night, three yep. in the morning, and I'm like, "Wow, I'm talking with Ivan Koloff, right. one of my I heroes." Mean, and it, yeah, this content has value. It does, and and I think there's we more should value today. We combine somehow. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely yeah. am going to reach out to you for that Eddie interview because another part of the podcast is going to be, you know, gone too soon. So there were so many guys that were on my show and, and girls yeah. who are not here anymore, who died from overdoses or oh, yeah. premature deaths. Oh, Sherry Martel died. Yeah. I, have, I have so many of them on my shows. I mean, so this is going to be brought back We're as like well. twin brothers from different mothers. I think so. I think so. <laughs> we I always, had similar paths. I always admired you uh, just because of the historical nature that you always, that was your, that was you. Oh, I mean, thank you. Uh, you know, wrestling then and now. I mean, uh, everything that you've done as a historian and the work that you've done in the film industry and the documentary uh, business. I mean, this stuff is, is classic today. So, thank you. so you know, the the podcast is launching. Uh, I'm in the final stages of negotiating a book deal called Matt Memories, uh, and and that will talk about you know my history in in wrestling, but also in music because I changed my name when I left wrestling to John Alexander. When you left wrestling, yeah. I disappeared. People, people were saying, "Did John Arezzi join the circus?" They were crazy. Well, rumors they thought I died. Around. Yeah, you know, a lot of people like Jake the Snake. When I saw him yesterday, he goes, "I thought you were dead." Yeah, crazy rumors. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I just got out. I couldn't handle it anymore. Yeah. After you know the the, the short lived partnership with Vince Russo, and I brought him into the business, uh, and and everything that happened, and all the beat downs from dealing with people who are pretty unsavory, it makes you kind of hate yourself in a way because you, you start to become one of them. Mm. And I wasn't that guy. And I was so happy when I got out and I was like, I'm turning the page on this and I don't want to go back to it ever. But I still watched it. It's interesting you say that because I book, I book legends for appearances. Mm. And I, I recently had a conversation. Um, I was trying to book a legend and... Um, the woman's like, well, we're a mom and pop operation, and we uh, we paid so and so uh, three hundred dollars, and I'm like, listen, at some point you cross the line between yeah. mom and pop and exploitative. You're crossing a line, right? And, That's true. And I said, you can't expect a legend to uh, hop on a plane, right. and you know, who's not a kid anymore, who's most likely in pain, you know, from decades of bumps. To come to your place for three hundred dollars, yeah. you know, and yeah. and it, you reach a point where it's like a love hate relationship with wrestling. And, Very true. Yeah. But I've always had it in my blood. So yeah, I me mean, too. And, and now I mean, I'm purely in, into it, not for the, not for the current state of the industry, and not for the angles and the promotions that are today. My my final chapter uh, of my career is going to be sharing this content with fans and with the public from the book from the podcast to other things i've planned and also and i brought something which has never been seen because it, it's being shopped right now uh you know i was asked to do some pilots ironically from the wwe uh because they they have a desire for all my eight millimeter films that wow. i have and I, from the early 70s to ten thousand pictures that i shot over the years at ringside so but you know 16 months have gone by and then they said, put together a couple little pilots of this Matt Memories concept. And I did. And, uh, but, you know, without getting direct communication and saying, well, you know, we've been talking for 16 months. So now it's being chopped to other interested parties. And today what I brought was an episode, a sample episode of the day I met Fred Blassie yeah. for the very first time because I ran his fan club. So I put together a little, uh, little three-minute pilot. But it also includes – this pilot includes – uh, never before seen footage of Pedro Morales versus Freddie Blassie, March 26th, 1973. I want you to know the very first match I ever went to was Nikolai and Br Nikolai and Blassie against Bruno and Strongbow, June 24, 1974. 1974. I was there. I was shooting it. And I never dreamt that Nikolai would become a friend. Yes. Both the Valiants would become yes. friends. Johnny Valiant would be sleeping on my couch. Right, I mean, right. It's very surreal. It is surreal. Yeah. It is surreal. I mean, those are the guys that I grew up with and loved, and those were my heroes growing up. Well, All of the guys. Well, since you set up the clip, why don't we show that? Yeah, I think it's, you'll like it. Thank you. Jim Savalli at the helm, our engineer and station owner. is live radio folks. yes it is <laughs> we got it mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Welcome to another edition of Matt Memories. I'm John Arezzi. This past February 8th would have been the 101st birthday of one of the all-time legends of professional wrestling, Fred Blassie. In today's edition of Matt Memories, I'm going to take you back to March 26, 1973. That was the day I first met the legendary King of Men. I had run a fan club for Fred Blassie beginning it in 1972 at the age of 14 years old. And on March 9th, 1973, I received a letter in the mail from none other than Freddie Blassie inviting me to meet him at Madison Square Garden on that day that he was wrestling Pedro Morales. I had never been backstage at a wrestling event before and Freddie Blassie was my hero. So getting to meet him that day was extraordinary for me. I was very, very nervous when I got to finally shake the hands of the man who I had the fan club for. I interviewed Freddie that day and I was a little nervous in doing so. Here's a quick clip from that interview. I've never claimed to be one of these uh, nicey nice guys. I've always said the shortcut is the best way. It makes no difference how you do it, just so you do it. You gotta punch your mother in the nose, punch her in the nose. You gotta punch your sister in the nose, punch her in the nose. Just so you win. I don't care how you win. After the interview was over, I went back to my ringside seat and took out my 8mm camera for that match, Fred Blassie against Pedro Morales at the historic Madison Square Garden. Here's some historic, never before seen footage of that night in Madison Square Garden, Fred Blassie versus Pedro Morales. It was one of the bloodiest brawls I had witnessed as a wrestling fan up till that date. Freddie held his own, but at the end of the match, it was stopped due to blood, and Fred couldn't continue. The winner of that match was Pedro Morales. As the years went by, Freddie and I continued our friendship, and I stayed in touch with him right up till the mid-90s when I featured him on one of my Pro Wrestling Spotlight radio shows. Here's a short clip from that. Well, Fred, unfortunately, we've run out of time, and uh, I can go another two hours. Well, here. same here, John. And, uh, yeah. Maybe we can do this again. That'll be great. And I just want to uh, thank the uh, World Wrestling Federation and Titan Sports, uh, uh, Steve Planamenta and uh, Fred Blassie, especially for uh, coming on the program here today. Uh, it's uh, really appreciated for them uh, allowing uh, you to make your presence known here on the radio with us. I've been waiting to do this, as I mentioned, in the onset of the show for well, thank you. a couple thank of years. You, and be sure and tell the family hello for me. I will. And uh, like I said, get in touch with Steve and if can be worked out, I'd be glad to do it again. Well, you know, maybe sometime in the near future we could uh, honor Fred Blassie with a luncheon or a special dinner uh, with the wrestling fans, and uh, we'll certainly talk to the office about that. And Fred, listen, thank you very, very much. Thank and uh, you. I'll send and I want to be sure and tell all those fans, keep those lines busy. That's right. Okay, thank you, Fred. You're welcome, Jay. Okay, that was the great Fred Blassie here at the Pro Wrestling Spotlight, and uh, uh, the two hours just uh, really flew by. To this day, Fred Blassie is remembered in the history of professional wrestling as one of the most charismatic performers ever to step inside a ring and also to manage some of the top stars in this business. Until next time, my name is John Arezzi. Thank you for watching Matt Memories. Arezzi with the late, great Fred Blassie. How much charisma did that man have? In June of 74, he was no kid, and he was still great. He was. Yeah. I mean, he was the, probably the most, the best heel I've ever seen. He, he would rile the crowd up into a frenzy. And um, in those matches against Morales, you couldn't even, 
you you thought there was going to be a riot that would break out, and so many people were dragged away from ringside who were trying to get at him. I mean, he was one of the most. Uh, he was one of the most. He struck fear in the hearts of the fans, and they hated him because he was the ultimate heel. Oh yeah, and ironically, as a kid, I would watch the L.A. tapings on Channel Twenty One, where, he was a baby face, where a they guy. loved him dearly. Yes. So as a kid, I'm trying to figure this out because I was a total mock. I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> you know. Well, that's why I was compelled with him too, because I used yeah. to watch Channel Forty One and see El Rubio, Freddie Blassie, the the hero of Los Angeles, and then he'd come to New York. And he'd be biting people on the head, and they'd be yeah. like the vampire. Right, right, right. So I mean, it was kind of, uh, and that's why I, I kind of like, I like, I, I respected him, I admired him, and he was so fascinating. That's he was why a I started, great heel and a great. He face. was. That's yeah. why I started the fan club for him, and that's what wow. got me in the business. Wow, and um, I love Piper and yes. Tolis and Morocco, oh, Tolis was great. Patera. These yes. guys were all great heels. Yes, yeah. it's not like that anymore. So I, I have a, since you mentioned him, it really bothered me that the WWE basically forgot about Pedro Morales. What was that all about? I don't know, man. Basically, I mean, you like didn't hear his name. Like he never existed. I know. He was huge. He was huge. He he, many sellouts. Uh, had a one of the most fanatical fan followings I've ever seen. Him and Bruno both, but Morales during that time. Even when Bruno was champion in the second run, I don't think the crowd ever got as frenzied as when Morales was in the ring. And that's one of the reasons why he can never lose <laughs> at Madison Square Garden. He only lost once in August of 71 due to blood with Stan Stasiak. Hmm. But they would he can never lose there because there would be a full-scale riot. Wow. That's how much the fans believed back then. Yeah. But they didn't do anything to tribute. To, really, it was a small little... Thing, but I mean Morales, and I have ca- I've captured most of his matches on eight millimeter film, and for them not to pay the respect that they that he deserved was kind of puzzling to me. And those you know thirty second little tributes when somebody dies, if they bother, yeah. it's it's not sufficient. I mean these guys generated millions of dollars over the years for Absolutely. them. You know, headlining up and down the East Coast yeah. and. You know, to have a little 30 second thing. Yeah. Ivan Koloff, I think they did 10 seconds. I mean, come yeah, on. There was, uh, come on. And, and Koloff is certainly deserving of, uh, of Hall of Fame Koloff status. Koloff headlined the Garden 13 times. Yes. yes. 13 times. Yeah. You know, the money that man generated. Oh, yeah, big money. And, and to not put him in the Hall of Fame and Patera and guys like that, it, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous. And. Um, Plug anything you want to plug, John. Well, I mean... Uh, and, and show us your memorabilia before we I mean, we I was at this convention yeah. yesterday, yeah. and there's a lot of dealers there, so I was like, I recognize some of the covers, and I mean, this is my third run in pro wrestling, if you look at yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, I keep getting reincarnated. Uh, so in the early 70s, I was a photographer uh, after the Fred Blassie fan club, and I was at the convention yesterday, and I was like, that magazine looks familiar, and sure enough... Billy White Wolf. Billy White Wolf on the cover. There is... Um, the John Arizzi photo gallery here with a bunch of my photos from back then. And, and talking about Ivan Koloff. Is that is that Mark Tendler on the other that side? That is Mark Tendler and Sh- Kitty, his Mark wife. Mark Tendler. Let's Mark see. Tendler was killed. He was killed. Yeah, I remember Mark. He yeah. always was at the... He was, he was murdered. He was always at yeah. the Coliseum. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. But then the... Talking about Koloff, this was a chain match that uh, took place in Boston. And so this is one of my wow. articles, and wow. and I still have all of and these WWF original pictures. And WWF did not have a lot of chain matches. That no, was they unique. did not. They actually reached out to me years ago uh, when they were doing a chain match, I believe, and they wanted usage of my photos, and I said, yeah, well, let's work something out, but they never got back to me at that time. <laughs> wow. So, and, and then, you know, and then at the same convention yesterday, I, you know, I saw this magazine. This is from the 90s, and, you know, this complete coverage of one of my conventions, and the one you say you got the chic uh, here he is, you know, the Sheik with Sabu. Yeah. I have a rare original Sheik autograph, Louis courtesy of John Arezzi. And there's our friend Nikolai Volkov. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, there's the other friend, Johnny Valiant, is yeah, on, in this wow. picture. Wow. So, I mean, those were great, uh, great, those were great days. And it's sad to see that most of these people have are passed, passed away. Yeah. So uh, my job now, I think, is just to kind of share this history uh, with the public uh, and the book, the podcast, but other plugs. I mean, I'm on social media now, uh, at John Arezzi, at J-O-H-N-A-R-E-Z-Z-I, and that's at Twitter. Uh, Instagram is the same handle, and I have a uh, group, uh, John Arezzi's Matt Memories on Facebook now, 
with a private member group there as well. So I'll, what I'm what I'm doing this year, Evan, is building the audience. There you go. Uh, uh, you know, because the book will probably not come out till uh, probably fall of 2020. So I think with the Twitter following I've uh, gotten and it's and it grows pretty pretty good every month. Um, all of that is designed, and the podcast now kicking off. So that'll build the audience, and hopefully the book will be the you know the final chapter. There you go. And you may not be aware, but June twenty second in Queens, NEW Wrestling has a tribute to Pedro Morales, which really? is nice. Which is much more than the WWE ever did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they're having a tribute. Uh, I'm not sure, but I believe they're going to invite some of his family, and uh, that'll be nice because he was out in Jersey. He wasn't, you know. Talking. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, and I think Bobby Backlund was like one of the only guys to go. Wow. Wow. Backlund came to um, our premiere for 350 days, mm -hmm. and he endorsed it publicly, which is nice. And if you like old school, check out 350 days. Yes. Top 20 on Amazon the I entire month it. it's been out. I Thank you, John. I bought it. I love it. Appreciate the support. Um, superstar Billy Graham, Bret Hart, Ted DiBiase, uh, Greg Valentine, Tito, Wendy Richter. Mm -hmm. Speaking of pioneers, Wendy Richter. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'll tell you. I grew up on Mueller at the Garden. Mm -hmm. She would come in. She would get unbelievable heel heat. Oh, my goodness, yes. Yeah. It wasn't about looking like you're out of Playboy. She, no, she'd she stir that tough. crowd up, boy. Yeah, because yeah. she was tough, and she was she was a, she was a roughhouser. Oh, she was yeah. stiff. I, I always used to see her wrestle Sue Green. Yes. They always had good matches. Or Vicky Williams. Vicky Williams. Sue Green, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. But anyway, wow. that's a another era and you know everything's changed but you know people like you who keep it alive too uh, and also give the public like a real behind the curtains view like it's what 350 days did and uh about what this business and what this life was really like yeah everybody thinks it's glamorous and uh, i get very tired of the fanboys doing the well, they pissed it all away on wine, women, and song. A lot of these guys never broke a hundred grand. Right. They're on the road supporting their families at home. And the corporate apologist thing, I just wrote a, an article for uh, ProWrestlingStories.com. Mm -hmm. You'd like it. It's old school website. Tons of history. And I said, you know, this is a billion dollar corporation. Vince... I don't know. He, he had a bad week, but as of a week ago, he's worth three point two billion dollars. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, how about health health benefits yes. and pensions and four hundred one ks for guys who sacrifice their body for you? And the fanboys like they know what they're getting into. And in, in just a few minutes, we're going to talk to a, a young wrestler, Nikolai White. And you know, I, I'm not quite sure that some of the young wrestlers know that at forty on their first rainy day you know your your body's gonna ache from all the bumps and you you could be future endeavored at any given moment and you know it's not all glamour yeah. they think these guys made millions of dollars and pissed it all away which is not always the case no and in many times and in most cases they never made the money to begin with kamala told me he ma face to face he told me i made 800 bucks in a sold out arena against hogan 800 bucks and then the fanboys like rationalize that. Well, eight hundred dollars is a lot of money. <laughs> like, dude, he sold out an arena. Not in comparison to what the revenue was. From you the, think Mick Jagger the, selling out that arena got eight hundred bucks? No. Come on. No. But it's changed today. It's a little bit different. But uh, the guys that we grew up with, uh, the sad stories, seeing how they are today. You know, yesterday I saw twenty wrestlers from the 80s and i'm not going to mention any names but half but, of them are in bad shape yeah and, and yeah and one gentleman who i did so much business with who didn't even recognize me and i booked him on several shows had him on the radio yeah. and i was like you, you he had no clue who i was and i was yeah. i was kind of shocked and the, the, i was the, sad the more chair than shots else. to the head night after night after night there are theories, and I'm not a doctor, but there are theories that that could lead to Alzheimer's. Yeah. And, and the multiple concussions certainly lead to memory loss. Yeah. I've had wrestlers tell me they've had 16 concussions, a dozen concussions. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that I, is not healthy for the no, human brain. No, it's not. I saw somebody at the convention yesterday who, I'm not going to mention names again, who is in the final stages of cancer. And uh, and here's somebody just like trying to sell some pictures to make a few dollars, and yeah. he was in the business for years, 
Uh, so it, it I'll, is. I'll same. take it a step further, and again, not mentioning names. I know Madison Square Garden headliners who pushed the broom after they were done, mm-hmm. you know, uh, with with yeah. their career. Yeah. How about health benefits, pensions, and 401ks? I'll say it another 37 times. This is for Michael Monty from Monty and the Pharaoh, who disagrees with me on this, although I love the guy. They do a wrestling show here. You should come on their show also. You'd be perfect for their show. They're on Thursdays, 8.05, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, what else can we say? I mean, I think... I don't know. I think uh, support these guys. Yeah, I think so, and I and I hope to. Uh, you got five grand for WrestleMania. Throw throw some bucks into a GoFundMe when Kamala's right. about to lose his house, right. or Billy Graham's got health issues. I, I, I it also burns me when the fans do the all those wrestler GoFundMe's are scams. No, they're not. They're not. Many of them need the money. Yes, that's very true. Yeah, um, I, I I really appreciate you inviting me here today i appreciate you inviting me in 89 when i sat next to cactus jack yeah. before he was famous remember that yeah, yeah. that was fun yeah he used to come on the show just to improve his promos and, he, I, just, and I was like his victim right, I was yeah i turn the mic on and i'll be <laughs> yeah. like just go and do yeah. your thing but yeah i mean we're gonna be playing a lot of that stuff on these uh podcasts so once again pwspod.com to subscribe and we're launching the first one within the next 30 days it'll be a lot of fun i would say you are one of the unsung heroes of the industry, but they just recognized you yesterday, which is nice. Show the plaque one more time. There you go. John Arezzi, promoter, radio host, filmmaker now, yes. documentarian. Yep. John Arezzi, thank you so much for everything you've done for the wrestling business, You're the welcome. country music business, and one of the pioneers, seriously. Thank you, Evan. Seriously. It's we good to be we here. go back a long time. Yes, we do. Thank you so much for appearing. Appreciate it. Coming up next, Nikolai White. We're going to talk indie wrestling. And later in the show, Paul DaCosta, virtuoso musician. And uh, we have Erica A. We're going to talk movies, TV, Game of Thrones. This is the eclectic mix known as the Evan Ginsberg Show. And we're going to show a clip from uh, 350 Days and also our sponsor, King of the Ring. And uh, our other sponsor, SWF Wrestling. They run weekend and in and out in New Jersey, SWF Wrestling. Let's see some uh, footage, Jim. Thank you. Hey, this is Fred David Van Hart, and I want to talk to everybody about the big documentary that's coming out 350 days after the life of wrestlers and things they did. Hi, this is Brian to Hammer Valentine. You gotta go see 350 days. That's right, 350 days because I'm in it. A lot of other great wrestlers are in it. Big names, big stars, talking about life and times of wrestling. And the main thing on the road. It's a great movie. We have lots of lessons, lots of lots of uh, road story, lots of funny stories, but the best stories are you watch is great. It's about my life, about wrestling lives years ago. What we used to go through on the road, fighting the matches, fighting fans sometimes. You got a rock and roll genetic here. We're rocking it, rolling, shrugging, throwing, slamming, jamming, moving, and grooving. Thank you, dear business, and have a good time tonight. I want y'all to see what wrestling is really all about. You have to win the rockers. Fight for your right to party. But 350 days, watch the movies and what really goes on behind the scenes. And we're going to still be home rocking. Let me tell you, it's about 350 days on the road that the professional wrestlers had to travel and make a living. I think it'll be really interesting. And I'll show you all the reasons I have all these injuries. You need to check out this documentary 350 days and get the taste of the blood of life. Oh, what's it? What I love and what I would die for. You check it out. Let's do a little thing and make it together. Come on! Good journey. 350 days. Come see me, Wendy Richter, in 350 days. Life on the road as a professional wrestler. Hey, this is your dad's soul road. You know who I'm talking about, the one and only, the sister, the doctor of style. I'm here to tell you, you need to do yourself a favor. Get out there, see the documentary, 350 days. I'm telling you, you need to see it. Don't miss it. It's a great, great story about the lives, not only of mine, but other people too. Each of us has our own individual story to tell of how we had a dream 
chased our dream. Some had greater success than others, and I was a fortunate one to have a great career. You know, sometimes when you dig deep and you scratch the surface, you don't really see the whole true story. But if you dig real deep, and you're really down there and look at it close, you find out what pro wrestling's all about. So I'm just going to say, I hope all my fans will get a chance to watch this because it's going to be a great documentary. Hello, wrestling fans. My name is Lanny Papo. 350 days on the road, and let me tell you what. Enjoyed every minute of it. This is Tito Santana. Come see me in the movie 350 Days. You will not regret it. You will see the pioneers how we live. Arriba! Kings of the Ring is wrestling's first audio drama podcast as a fictional depiction of the 1980s wrestling industry in and out of the ring. Join us as we take you back to the 1980s. You'll be a fly in the wall in the locker rooms of the past while the wrestlers put together matches. We'll take you into the jam-packed arenas where the rabid fans of the past believed everything they saw was real. We'll take you inside the ring where you'll hear what the wrestlers talk about and you can feel the action. We'll take you to the underbelly of the arena where the wrestlers got into all sorts of trouble. And we'll take you to the bars and clubs where the boys got into even more trouble. <laughs> and it wouldn't be 80s wrestling if we didn't end up at the <clears throat> hotel room. Search Kings of the Ring from any podcast app or go straight to the website, kingsotr.com. All right, we are back with the Evan Ginsberg Show at villageconnectionradio.com, and we are joined by young wrestler from the IWW, a new promotion based out of Queens. We have Nikolai White. How are you today, Nikolai? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Thank you. When I say Nikolai, I expect to see Nikolai Volkov yes. sitting there. <laughs> so uh, how'd you get the name Nikolai? Uh, my mom used to watch a lot of TV shows. Um, she, um, my mom got my sister's name from a TV show called Sister Sister. Really? And my my name came from a show called Vampire Nights. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Whatever works. Yeah. Whatever works. Mm -hmm. So IWW. Um, Tom Frazier is the owner. Imani Labels is his right hand man. I don't know his exact title. What's Imani's title? It's, uh, C. Um, no. Um, Chief Operating Officer. Chief Operating Officer. Yeah. Okay. Um, we were at the press conference yesterday in Queens. And Wonderful event, actually. Yeah, it was really nice. It had a, like a real warm feel mm -hmm. to it. And um, I never understand why people run an indie promotion in New York, which is not cheap. You need a doctor in attendance, an ambulance. The venues are not cheap to, to rent. You know, there's real expenses running an indie wrestling show in New York. And then they do, like, no promotion. They have their pretty website. They have their Facebook page. And they think they're done. These guys had a full-fledged press conference, you know, and everything's being filmed and everything's being, you know, put put out there on social media. Imani is really on top He's of things. He's on top of it. Like, yeah. some, some, like, this is exciting to me. Like, Imani, like, I know our neighbors for, like, two years. And he, we've been talking about this for quite some time now. And the way how you execute this um this business deal is is wonderful. And you came all the way from Harlem. We're out way out in Long Island. Way out in Long Island. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll tell you, <laughs> Imani set it up, and a lot of indie wrestlers they don't want to be bothered. It's too early. It's too far. If there were a ring here, they'd be here. But <laughs> you know, so even in that sense, you know, it's publicity, free publicity, good publicity, and. I think these guys are going to make it, and believe me, I've been around I, this. I believe it too. I've been around this forever, and I've seen indie promotions one after another shut down and lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. I once saw a guy in the same night lose thirty-five grand and his girlfriend. The girlfriend walked out on him, and she was beautiful. I'll never forget it. This was in Indiana. I, I went down there with uh, Johnny Valiant and. Uh, yeah, man, it's um, 
Can I ask a question? But was he more upset about losing the money or more upset about losing the girl? Uh, I honestly don't know. <laughs> We'd have to ask him. This was a long time ago. But um, so I, I think IWW has um, Imperial World Wrestling. Is Imperial that? World Wrestling. Imperial World Wrestling. I think they have a real shot at making it. And I like Tom Fraser's idea. Like, we just had a wrestling country music guy here mixing wrestling and hip hop, yeah. mixing wrestling and music. Cause that's that's on my lane. I really I really like music. And sitting in this room, actually, I see some of the guys like I I listen to all the time, like Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, I listen to a little bit of John Jim Morrison. Really, uh, a little bit. Of, yeah, I'm in. I'm. I really like music. Yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm a music guy. Um, in fact, I put on Facebook today. Sometimes I just need to hear some live music or need to get to an indie wrestling show mm-hmm. or need to get to the theater. Mm-hmm. It's like in your DNA after yes. all these years. And um, in the next few weeks, I'm, and Mark, make a mental note of this. In the next few weeks, I'm going to see Al Green, who's probably the world's greatest living performer. Yes. I'm going to see Zap. You remember Roger Troutman? Ro- Roger Troutman. <laughs> The DNA of hip hop is really James Brown, Roger Troutman, and George Clinton from P Funk. Uh, the, the psychedelics. The uh, psychedelic, funkadelic. The funkadelics. Funkadel- Funkadel- yeah. So, um, going to see Zap. Um, who else? Roger Troutman's been dead a long time, but Zap mm-hmm. is still out there without him. And um, who else? Um, Nona Hendrix from LaBelle. Mm. There's a, you know, I, I just love live music. Yes. But anyway, this is about wrestling, wrestling and you. Wrestling, so tell wrestling, us a little wrestling. about yourself. Tell us um, about... I started um, watching wrestling um, when I was seven years old. Uh, barring, um, this is how I discovered wrestling. Um, discovering, um, sorry, discovering like um, tapes. Yeah. I was watching TV shows and stuff. I was borrowing like so, uh, family members tapes and it so happened it was like an episode of Raw and I just got hooked on it and I never saw wrestling after that after like a few years until I was playing video games and my cousins and my and my sisters and my brothers was playing video games and it was wrestling Wow! and I was like this is what I want to so do so who were some of the guys who influenced you? to be honest um, I was living in the projects um, I was unfortunate that I have a lot of cable when I was younger, so the guys in my neighborhood would put on shows in the parks. Really? And they would wrestle in the parks. Wow. And those are the guys I look up to because I grew up around them. Those were my heroes. So these were like backyarders. Backyarders. But, but they were serious, yeah, though. They were serious. Did any of them make it? Yes. Who? Some, some of them are, um, are on the road now. Really? And they were all champions. Wow. Yeah. Wow, awesome. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So... Who, which wrestlers do you most appreciate now as a wrestler? As a wrestler, I, I've watched a lot of Japanese stuff, a lot of technical stuff. Um, where I learned my technical stuff is this guy from England called Johnny Saint. Oh, that's yeah, why I, that's why Johnny I Saint's all, old school. Yes, um, yeah. that's why I learned all my chain wrestling. And all really, that stuff. um, Japanese, I, I look up to um, Okada Okada is great too, Okada is great, yeah, yeah. but Musawa, yeah, Musawa, um. I adopted the rolling elbow from him, and I, huh. I, I love his matches. Love his matches. Kenta, who's yeah. not who used to be here, Dayo Tommy. Yeah, but boy, did, boy, did WWE ever waste him? <laughs> Tragic. Tragic. Yeah, man. They but, they WWE has a way of making somebody a huge star or destroying them. Uh-huh. When when he when he first came to the E, I was excited. I was like, oh, he's gonna kill it. He's gonna kill it. Then like injuries happen. Like the neck injury and then his shoulder and after that it was just falling down hill. I used to watch his matches when I was a teenager on YouTube. Like, like I mean, nonstop. how do you how do you waste a guy like that? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's this theory. They go, well, the Japanese guys can't cut great promos. You're a billion dollar corporation. Hire an ESL teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you have these incredibly talented people. Nakamura is basically another guy on a card now. I saw Nakamura wrestle AJ Styles at Wrestle Kingdom. It was one of the greatest one matches the greatest I've ever matches, seen. Yeah. I mean, how do you waste Nakamura? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't get it. But anyway, so tell us about um, IWW. I IWW. Mean, it really w- sounds promising. It's... Um, I think this is going to take over the country. Really? This is, this is I, I'm 
fully confident this is going to like take off. IWW um a minor label side of it. They um this draft, we just had a draft the um we we picked like 10 10, 10 wrestlers out of the uh, across the country. I was one of those guys who got drafted. And um yeah, this is uh, and our and our, our our show, our first show is going to be June 29th called Breakthrough. And um and Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King High School yes, in, in Queens. Queens, yeah. Yeah, that's practically my backyard. I live mm-hmm. in Queens, so uh, I plan on being there. And um, do you know who you're wrestling? I don't got all the details yet, but whoever whoever is my first opponent, they're gonna they're gonna see my talents there, yeah, cause you know. I'm assuming you're a face. We don't know yet. You don't we know don't yet. Know, we don't know really? Yet. We don't that's know interesting. Yet. Yeah, we don't know yet. Wow. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, tell us about some highlights of your career thus far. Um, well, this is like, right now, this is like a real huge step for me and my, or I'm, I'm, I'm relatively new in the, in the, uh, in the wrestling scene. Um, I, I was wrestling in the Bronx for a couple of years now and somehow he minded labels. Um, he's, he saw my B- old BWF. BWF, yes. Yeah, I've been down to yeah, BWF. Yeah. Imani Labels. Bronco um, looks like Bluto from Popeye. <laughs> okay. The guy, the guy so looks big. like a wrestler. He's so big. Like, oh my God. Yeah, it's scary. When, when Bronco walks down the street, people must go, that guy's a wrestler. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Imani Labels um, saw my old footage when I was 13 years old. I was the Apple Store kid. I don't know if you heard it. Um, I got viral off lip syncing. Mm hmm. And um, that that took off. Uh, I flew out to California for stuff. I was performing all that, and then um, you, you, I left you, that to pursue rest of my wrestling career. You you want you want to do something for us? We're we're an arts program. Do some improv. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't got nothing prepared. I'm just <laughs> oh, well, next time. <laughs> next time. Next time. Next time. Right. Yeah. Um, that and. Started wrestling and then um, these guys, the guys I used to talk about when I used to, who I looked up to, I wrestled in the parks too, like dumb stuff. When I was a kid, I was a kid, you know. You gotta, you gotta start somewhere. The Hardys were backyarders. Yeah, yeah, the they Hardys, made it big. Yeah, they made it big too. Um, yeah, so that's like I said, I'm relatively new. This is like a huge step for me. This is all of this like radio stuff. Like this is like exciting nope. for me. There you this go. This is new. Yeah. Well, um, I want you to know that in that very chair where you're sitting, Mm -hmm. we've had um, Greg Valentine, we've had um, Barry Wyndham. Barry Wyndham yesterday. Yesterday. Barry Wyndham was sitting there yesterday. I'm I'm gathering all the the energy, right? Oh, bro. (laughs) Everybody. Monty and the Pharaoh bring these guys. I I had Coco Beware a couple weeks ago. Um, Lanny Poffo's done all our shows. Mm. Um, yeah, we've uh, had had some of the greatest got, names I, in the I business. I'm, I hope I'm getting their like their talents of you know the energy and get that talents all over me. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so June 29, Saturday night. Okay, so here's my big question. Yes. Let's say it's Saturday night, Queens. There could be a half dozen shows that night. Mm-hmm. Long Island, <laughs> Queens, um, Jersey. Jersey why why should the fans decide IWW is the show to go to it's the talent we we have hungry hungry talent some these young guys want a name for themselves including me so everybody's going to give 110% 100 a 1000% 1000% 1000% that's even better than 110% mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I studied math in high school. Yeah, so oh, yeah, these young guys, they they just want to like they want they want eyes on them. And I think IWW will give that to them. Now, I've spoken with many, many, many promoters over the years, and sometimes they listen with like half an ear, and I I generally tell them the same things. And I liked what I heard from Tom yesterday. He says, we're going to keep this to two and a half hours. I've been to indie wrestling shows that are four and a half hours, five and a half hours. And it's an <laughs> endurance forever, contest. Ever. And not everybody needs to be on the mic. 
You know, you don't need 17 interviews. Mm -hmm. You don't need 17 matches. You you don't need endless ticket sellers who really don't belong in the ring. You need guys with gear. You need guys that, Mm -hmm. you know, look like wrestlers. And you need a mic that works. You know, I mean, I've been I've been to indie <laughs> yeah. shows. It's just like a pounding in your head. It's like whoa, 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 and I'm yeah. like, I don't understand one word. Yeah, we I had say. we had a little trouble at the press conference with the mic. Yeah, but it was minor. Yeah, it was but was I'm minor, just saying, yeah. <laughs> if you're sitting there for three, four, five hours, and another thing, you don't need blaring sound. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not a hip hop show. <laughs> you, you know, it doesn't have to be so loud that it's deafening because that sucks the energy out of the audience. Also, mm-hmm. you know. Um, what, what, I, what I tell promoters, old school, you have your seven or eight or nine matches. You know, you have two or three guys on the mic. You build towards the next show. Always leave them wanting more. I, I've seen steel cages set up at 12.30 at night. <laughs> and you got there at 7.30 at night. Uh-huh. It's ridiculous. I mean, you know, put on a quality show that's tight, that works without it being overkill. Uh, Tom Frazier says he wants to have at least a bi-monthly show, you know, in the, to start with. Six shows a year. Mm-hmm. Build to the next show. Mm-hmm. Leave them wanting more. Mm-hmm. You, you don't need endless, endless matches. Mm-hmm. And the main thing I tell promoters, and again, they kind of yes you, but I go, forget about nepotism and cronyism. This is my buddy, this is my girlfriend, this is my cousin. Put the best talent on. The best talent. That's how you make it, you know. And and another thing, I I, I hate to pontificate, but I love indie wrestling and I support it, so I want to see promotions succeed. You know, everybody on the card should be out promoting. You You got up at the crack of dawn to come out to promote. A lot of these guys, by the way, I'm wrestling in two hours. <laughs> That's not promoting. That's not at all. Yeah. You know, they're talking about Raw and SmackDown. Talk about your match. Mm-hmm. So this is the end of April. You got two solid months to promote this. Every wrestling fan should know about this show, and every wrestler on the show should promote this show. And maybe that's a little more important than you know this guy's a wee bit better than that guy well if the one guy doesn't promote at all and the other guy's killing himself i'd book that guy yeah because you it's a business it's the wrestling business i've seen indies i i I couldn't i'm not making this up i went to an indie once with one paid one paid ticket Mm -hmm. everybody else was friends and family of the wrestlers the guy you know the promoter lost his shirt I've been to indies with a couple dozen people. You know how many times I've been to the Elks Lodge where there's 75 people <laughs> on Queens Boulevard? 75 people. I mean, it's a business. You, you know, they're going to throw down thousands of dollars. This let, business is tough. Yeah, let everybody promote. Yeah. It's not just that, you know, 37th high spot. How about that 37th post promoting your match? You, 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 <laughs> yeah. you follow my logic? <laughs> yeah. So... Um, much respect for you, Thank you. to uh, come out on a Sunday instead of. Um, we had guys in your we had guys in your company like oversleep the interview. So uh, <laughs> in your company, I won't mention names, but uh, much respect I, to you I, I for to making the effort. Yeah, I had to come here because there's a lot of pressure on me. You know, Damn. a lot of pressure. Yeah, <laughs> but, but it's I'm, good I'm pressure. Here, it's, it's good. good pr- yeah, good yeah. pressure. But I'm handling it very well. Barry Windham sat there yesterday. Maybe maybe years from now you'll be you'll be the next Barry Windham yes. or Coco Beware. Uh-huh. You know, we've had legends right <laughs> on that couch, so you it's never great. know. It's it's a it's a crazy business. Like like I said before, John Arezzi, who was uh, just interviewed, I sat next to Cactus Jack on his show, and mm-hmm. Cactus Jack was making fifty bucks a night sleeping in cars. Guy's a millionaire. You you never imagined that I mean, you knew he had something special. But you never imagined them being a WWE champion, going from like indies. Mm-hmm. So strange things happen in this business. Strange things. No, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing that right now. This strange things is really happening to me right now, and I'm I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be here. Oh, thank, thank you for you. inviting me. That's very kind of you. I'm blessed to be in IWW, and and I'm blessed for the future. I was just a fan 
sitting in Madison Square Garden, Nassau Coliseum, um, Westchester County Center, etc. And years later, you know, I'm a producer on The Wrestler and we're at Lincoln Center, 2,300 people sold out getting a standing ovation and Mickey Rourke's up for Best Actor at the Academy Awards. You know, strange things happen when you're passionate about things and you stick it out and, you know, you never know how... Mm -hmm. At bare minimum, you could see the world on somebody else's dime as a wrestler. I know wrestlers that wrestled for oil sheiks in Saudi Arabia three in the morning. I know wrestlers who went to India and wrestled in front of 100,000 people. I mean, it's it's a strange business. I mean, it could be disgraceful you know the promoter i'll give you two hot dogs for your work or it could be you know an amazing amazing ride and uh some of my best friends i've met in wrestling and there were other people i wouldn't piss on if they were on fire Mm -hmm. you know it's that kind of business but i met some great people in wrestling so uh i don't really regret a lot of it i really um but uh, anyway, give out any social media. Give out IWW's information. Um, IWW is on uh, Instagram. We on Facebook. IW World Wrestling. Imperial I, World Wrestling. Imperial World right. Wrestling. I'm, I'm I'm on Instagram heavily, so you could search me and underscore. spell your name because it's different than Nikolai yeah, yeah. Volkov. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. It's, under, it's at underscore N I C H O L I White on Instagram. I have a friend who's a comedian, Nico White. You have almost the same name. Yeah. This kid's going to make it. This this kid has been doing comedy. He's not a kid anymore. He's in his like mid-20s. Um, he's been doing comedy since he was 13. Yeah. And the guy is legitimately funny. He's done thousands upon thousands of shows. And he, he's he's a touring comedian, headline comedian all around the country now. He did our show. Remember Nico White? And uh, N-E-K-O. And... Uh, I always said this guy's gonna make it, and and, and he he has, and he's like one big break away from really blowing mm-hmm. up. So uh, Nikolai White and Nico White. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, anyway, thanks so much for appearing you, on the show, you. and uh, come back and uh, you know promote yes. IWW again. And everybody, I want everybody to know to drink more water, stay hydrated. <laughs> it's, a <laughs> it's a public service <laughs> message <laughs> from Nikolai White. Drink more water. Drink more water. I, I actually have water in the uh, green room for our guests, so uh, I'm, I'm part please, of that. I'm please, part of that important yes, campaign. Please provide the love for them, please. Thank you. <laughs> come, come to our green room and drink water. <laughs> Thanks so much, thank Nicola. You. Thank I you appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It was a hard life on the road, but it was, you know, it was a lot better than a lot of other jobs. You know, I. I had a construction job, I think, um, before I got into wrestling. A pretty good paying construction job, a couple of them, and uh, I made pretty decent money, but I hated sitting around talking shop with guys at Conjure and Coffee Break about work, like about, um, you know, what kind of, you know, gaskets we needed for the rig or whatever. It was, I hated it. I slowly talked myself into wrestling. physical pain, a lot of loneliness. But you have no home life whatsoever. Piper and me riding down the road, doing eight balls of cocaine. I'm sure it broke up marriages. How many guys uh, in the wrestling business have a family left when they're done? Most of them lose it. I couldn't have children. I couldn't put them on a turnbuckle while mommy worked. I hit the bars and 
That was my character. Sitting in a room with a bunch of wrestlers doing cocaine, we really got to know each other. I would take a lot of downers, and uh, I, I did have problems with the, with the downers. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I was not a faithful husband from the first day, for the whole time, on the road. I lived a double life. I needed it. It was like, I'm not getting the love I needed home. What I do, all of what I do, oh my God, I'm afraid to say I would do it again. I wouldn't change it then. No regrets. Well, I want to tell you, you know, to make some big money in wrestling, you had to wrestle every night of the week, $30 every day. So you had to wrestle six and seven times every week just to earn your money. 350 days on the road with wrestlers, a living hell. All right, we are back with the Evan Ginsberg Show at VillageConnectionRadio.com. Later in the show, we have musician Paul DaCosta who's going to perform live. But right now, we have Erica A. talking arts. And we are both engaged, not engaged to be married, engaged in Game of Thrones. Intensely in-depth in Game of Thrones. That's right. Tell us, tell us your thoughts. Well... Do you want me to go how deep into thoughts? I mean, we're two episodes in. We're building up to tonight. It's going to be one of the first of the extended hour and a half or two hour long episodes. Tonight, 37 people die. <laughs> or everyone dies. And only the White Walkers will come back and they'll all zombify walking there. Probably not likely. Why, why do you think in uh, 2019 there's such a fascination with zombies? Walking oh, Dead, a, Fear the Walking Dead. There's been a fascination with zombies for about the last... Eight, ten years. But why is that? What does that say about our culture? That people want to be prepared for the end of the world. So uh, we think the end of the world is coming. I don't. You but don't? No. I think that will last mm. until we have to live underground like mole people. <laughs> that sounds promising. <laughs> mole people. Wow. Well, yes. Yeah, so Game of Thrones. Maybe. Uh, You've been waiting how many years for this? I know you needed me uh, on to come back. Twenty-seven just... years since the le- since the previous <laughs> season. It was like two years, right? Yes, it was like two years yeah. since we saw Jon Snow and Daenerys Targaryen and the Starks. As all the jokes are in line, they wished good luck to all the Starks that are going to die this weekend. Wow. I know we're like the only people who probably didn't get to Marvel's and Avengers end game so no spoilers yeah i already saw the first spoiler for uh, the avengers and uh you just you just want to some guy in china got beaten up because yes, he gave spoilers, spoilers outside the theater and there's like this thing that the pope says you're going to purgatory if you give spoilers <laughs> really really <laughs> i don't wow. know if that is fake news yeah or I, that's I think that's fake one, news but there's that floating around online too the pope says i will beat your ass if you give avengers <laughs> spoilers that's probably not real <laughs> so so, there's nothing to spoil yet on Game of Thrones. We've only had one real death, and it was a minor one. Okay, and, and remind me, because okay. it's so minor it I was, don't remember. It was, two, it was in the first episode. They went to the, they, one of the other castles. All the characters, we didn't know if they were dead or alive when the wall fell down, were alive, and they found one of the castles, and the only person who's still there is the body of one of the little lords, one oh. of the lesser lords, and they find his dead body nailed to the wall, and then you get the good shock val- value. It's like the shock factor. If it's like, oh, there he is. What did they do? And then he comes alive. I was so shocked screamed. I forgot all of this. Okay. <laughs> anyway. And they burn his body. End of plot. They move back to the main characters. Wow. Um, you know what else I've been watching that I've really gotten into? Better Things on okay. Hulu. You never saw it. No, but, I'm uh, not on my streaming service. It's an actress. who the, the character is an actress who plays a single mom. And she has three daughters. And she's just like like overwhelmed with life and uh it's so real it's so she looks like a real person she doesn't like look like a perfect you know perfect looking actress and it's just it just rings true the whole thing better things i really enjoy it i've been not as much on ovation these days i'm actually on amc a bit more still got into the badlands it's going into its final season got now killing eve came back and right after i heard good things about that yeah it's an interesting show and you asked me what the new vampire show that i spoke of i didn't have a title yet is actually the show on right after killing eve it's called discovery of a witch wow so it's about a witch that meets a vampire 
It's two only for, a two for the price of one. Yes, everyone's <laughs> yeah. favorites. Wow. You don't have to watch the weird franchise on the CW anymore. All right, so you're the perfect person to ask this question. What is the line between enjoying a golden age of TV with this endless quality content and where it's just too much, where you're, you know, is, you're sitting well, in front of a box. Well, you're asking the wrong person then. You're ask, there's never too much. Never too much. Well, but what about people creating their own art? What about people, you know, I, I don't want to sit in front of a TV or a computer endlessly. Well, if someone else is creating their own art, they want someone else sitting there to be able to look at it. Okay. Unless you can be there live to actually experience it while it's happening, you've got to be able to get your media out there. And so the openness and the ability to reach out to people is the importance of what entertainment is. I mean, there's nothing but here's, here's the worse, thing. in my opinion, than people who want to stare at themselves at their phone, making faces into the camera and singing along with someone who's a better singer than them and calling that art. Or uh, being at a great concert and taking 37 pictures of yourself. It's a little <laughs> narcissistic. <laughs> With the musicians behind you, instead of enjoying yes, the show. That you turn around and it's like, yeah. I'm at the concert. Yeah. I'm here. I'm having a great time. Ooh, Look at me. Yeah. Look at me, I'm here. It's I crazy. like the geniuses who take pictures on top of mountains and fall off the mountains. <laughs> I, I think that's brilliant. Well, they did that in Game of Thrones too, so. Wow. So, um, so who do you what do you want to see happen tonight on Game of Thrones? I know you've been waiting this. I want to see uh, Peter Dinklage uh, kill like eighty two walkers. White well, walkers. he's going to be in the cave. So the only ones he's going to get to kill is if the fan theories are correct that everyone that is buried down there is going to be awoken with all the people that are coming at them. But what well, that's something I can't stand. That once the episode comes, there's like a bombardment of I, of every little detail about the show being overanalyzed, yeah. to the fact that there are multiple articles out there about someone's head is in the background in one of the single frames of the preview of next week. Yeah, people get a little obsessive. I like the uh, one-hour therapy session, uh, <laughs> Talking Dead after Walking Dead, well. where they bring the actor who was just killed <laughs> onto the set, and they go, "Look, he's not really dead because." The fans are so stupid, they think he's dead. Well, at least Gotham never needed to do that because they just brought the characters back a year later anyway. Oh, but yeah, Gotham finally ended. I'm not how sure. Are you, how, how are you I coping with that? I'm not sure how I feel about the ending. I'm still I, never, I haven't watched one episode yet, okay. so I'm, I'm handling it okay. Supernatural, I'm disappointed they're announcing that the show is going off the air after 15 years. Well, you should have got your fill by now. It's 15 years. <laughs> oh, I took a break from it in the middle. But yeah, it just had its finale. It's got one season left. They're coming back and shooting it, and then it's going off. And they went for a real, like, over-the-top ending. I'm like, what are you going to do to be, to try and top that? So that's some. you asked me what I'm going to live without. I don't know how I'm going to live without Supernatural. Okay, uh -huh. I've, I've, I'll I've, find I've, something I've new. never asked you this question before, but okay. if you were on a desert island and you could only take, like, five DVDs of five shows, what would they be? What are your five favorite shows? I think it would be Bewitched. Bewitched? <laughs> Bewitched? It what do you be think, Batman, Jim? It would be Batman, the animated series. <laughs> really? <laughs> it would be maybe Supernatural. If I could take one DVD, I got all 15 seasons there. <laughs> that will keep me occupied. How about, I don't know. I'd have to think about that one. I named my top three there. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this off the top of my head. The Wire, which I think was the greatest series ever made. The Prisoner with Patrick McGowan. Um, Game of Thrones. I think Game of okay. Thrones is tremendous. Um, the early seasons of The Walking Dead I thought were just great. I think in the middle it kind of uh, jumped the shark. It's, this past season was really good. Well, that's what I was saying. Some yeah. shows, if they last long enough, they're able to come back from it. You have an off year. But you're able to work through it. The plot didn't work, and it comes back. So I'm glad Walking Dead is improved for you. And Paul DeCosta, our upcoming, upcoming guest, will appreciate this. <laughs> Soul Train, because early on they perform live. You would see James Brown, Al Green, Sly and the Family Stone performing live. It was unbelievable. How about Saturday Night Live? Would you take that with you? No, then you no. Get... I think that runs hot and cold. I, I think some of it's hilarious, and some of it is awful. 
So uh, I have mixed emotions on Saturday Night Live. It's all subjective anyway. I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of great shows. And The Twilight Zone, you could put that in any top ten. So what do you think of The Twilight Zone returning? That I, I, have, I haven't question. seen it. I don't well, have that. Well, it isn't back yet. Oh, okay. They've just announced that it's coming. I believe that's it's why I haven't be a seen it. Show. <laughs> That'll explain why I haven't seen it. I believe it's a summer show that's coming. It's going to the CBS streaming service. It's not even going to their basic network channel. Okay, so, so so people on a, seem to be upset that they're bringing it back, and it's like okay. <laughs> on a nice summer day, would you rather be at the beach or watching uh, eighteen hours of TV? <laughs> yeah. Neither. I'd rather be in a, under a tree. <laughs> okay, under a tree watching. Uh, I don't understand how people could watch TV on their phones. It's like, you know, like Game of Thrones is epic. What do you want to see like on a decent sized screen? I agree. There are certain TV shows, certain movies that you just have to see it in theaters. It's not the same watching it on your own time. Guys watching porn on their phones, that's scary in and of itself. <laughs> just well, scary. I guess they'd be, they, don't have to, they can imagine what they're missing. Yeah, that's probably it right there. So, also looking forward to the Spanish Princess coming out. I have no week. idea what that is. That is the third season, I guess you can call it, of a series that sort of spins off on itself. It started off as the White Queen, and then a few years later, Stars brought the next part of the series, the White Princess. And now the third part, which is the Spanish Princess. Okay. It's a... Um, a sort of it's based on a book franchise and it's sort of like a fantasy version of the english royal family oh, so the white queen interesting. is about the war of the roses yeah and they sort of take it from the queen's point of view instead of the actual battles these historical epics um historic epics i should say uh they're either stultifying or they're, or they're tremendous it's like one extreme or the other well i think it goes to it's in the middle. There are some really great episodes that really make you move you and they really make you care and the battle is enjoyable. And then there are some episodes which are just the background music as they're walking back and forth, building to the next point in history that they can work from. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll try to check that out. So, Spanish princess, which, if you can take a guess, who would be the Spanish princess if we're talking about that? You mean the actress? No. Who would be the next person the story would be about? I don't know. You tell Catherine me. Catherine of Aragon. Wow. Okay. We're talking about the Tudor dynasty. You could, you could put a million dollars in front of me. I couldn't answer that question. Okay. But, okay. So it's young, it's young Henry and young Catherine and his brother's still alive and he's going to die. Because that's history. Spoiler alert. Spoiler you know, alert. Read you know, a textbook. No, Learn the, something. At the end of Spielberg's Lincoln, he dies. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> at the end of Titanic... The ship has to go down. Yeah. You, you know, um, it would have been an interesting take on it. Like, you go, like, alternate universe where <laughs> the ship just sails and it's like the love boat and nothing happens at the end of Titanic. Okay, so you wish it was Ghostbusters 2 and the Titanic just pulled in. Exactly. Exactly. Ghostbusters 2. Isn't today your buddy Randy Unger's birthday? It is. A, it is either today or tomorrow or his birthday party was last night so happy birthday randy when, when i hear ghostbusters i think randy you don't think about dan shaggy um, the professional ghostbuster cosplayer i like dan i like dan so, <laughs> anyway, okay anyway <laughs> so, now that yeah. we went off on that tangent so you don't watch enough things on amc you talk about all the time the walking dead fear the walking dead there are so many other shows so yeah killing eve into the badland discovery of of a wit of the witches or of a witch i'm not sure about the s <laughs> yeah because as the title is up on the screen it's like it gets cut off right around witch hmm. i don't get the last letter so i can't tell if there's an e so you could watch a show for the next 15 years and not know the title because your tv cuts off the credits well when i was a toddler there wasn't even anything there and so i called it whatever i felt like wow. my mother would sit there what are you watching james bond which one the horsey movie the horse which the yes. horsey movie. The one with Christopher Walken as the villain. Oh, okay. And then there's the cello movie, which was 1987. And then I so on. It was like, I didn't care what it was called. I knew what it was. <laughs> yeah. Wow. The, the, you, you have a, a surreal existence, <laughs> uh, for better and for worse. You watch more TV than any human being I know. Mm. Okay. And then I've got all my anime, but I know you don't want to know. I'm not even going to make any recommendations this time okay. around. So, so tell the uh, tell the viewers, the listeners, which uh, which anime should they be watching in 2019? Hunter Hunter. 
which must be so nice they finished. named it twice <laughs> well there's an x in the middle but oh, it's okay. a silent okay. just like django wow the d is silent wow haha <laughs> okay <laughs> okay there i got a giggle out of you Anyway, plug anything you want to plug. Oh, nothing y- right y- now. I do have a friend who wants to start a new project, but he is way too all over the place. So right now it's more just listening to his ideas and telling him that's not possible. Try again. This sounds like it has, um, it has great, great potential. It <laughs> has potential of being at City Field and having people who don't exist anymore playing the lead characters. And I'm wow. like, they're dead. That doesn't work. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to book these guys once they're dead. Um, once they're yeah, unless they turn into walkers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or mummies. Or mummies. Anyway, we are going to wrap this up. Erica A. And uh, you want to give out any social media? or uh, Look me up on Facebook. Erica, E-R-I-C-K-A, last name, A-S-S-E-R-S-O-N. You can always email me, erica.a268 at hotmail.com or look for me online. I'm always around looking for new projects, looking for new ideas, and just looking for the end of what happens on shows. <laughs> there you go. I don't think we could end on a better note than that. And coming up in just a moment, musician Paul DaCosta, who is going to perform live in studio for us. And uh, we'll be back in just a moment with the Evan Ginsberg Show at villageconnectionradio.com. Thank you, Erica. Glad to be here. Bye, okay. everyone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The wrestling fan, you know, they loved you or, or they hated you. You know, if, if the fan loved you, they couldn't do enough for you. You know, they, they want to buy your meal, they want to buy your drink. I, I think it was one of the main reasons that, you know, whenever I stepped into the ring, I, I wanted to give back. I wanted to satisfy their reason for coming out and watching me wrestle. I tell you what, I treated fans with respect and they loved me back. Whether I was a heel or a baby face, it didn't matter. I learned right from the get-go with my, my parents that it was to, to appreciate every single fan that you got, every one. You know, I think that's one of the reasons I've had longevity in wrestling is that I always treated my fans with uh, a lot of respect. They wanted to kill me trying to get to my car, and they always knew I was in a Cadillac or something. And, and it was, uh, you know, they, yeah, you're, you were in fear for your life sometimes. The New Jersey crowds were always great in the Boston Garden. They were dangerous in the Boston Garden. The fans were, they were believers uh, in that era. They believed the doggone thing was real. And uh, they they, uh, were very, some of the fans were very violent. I look back on it and I'm saying, well, you put up a lot of you know what, but you know something, that's what drove me to do it. Because the more those people hated me, more of this I made. I was being punched and kicked, and I was having beer thrown on me. I was having, I was having, being hit by chairs. How angry do you want to make your wrestling fans? How much do you want to butcher up your baby faces until they're like they're all bleeding and they're being beaten by eight or ten guys? I mean, how far can you push an audience before they lose it and? Then you have the Alamo kind of thing. Play with people's heads, you know. You, you gotta play with their minds, you gotta play with them. Psychology. Because that's how you manipulate people. And that's what I do. That's what I did for a living. I manipulated you when you were a kid. I know I did. But you didn't probably didn't like me, or you might have liked me, because I was that way. And a lot of people did. A lot of people didn't. Thank you for the living I made at it, people. You were very good to me. Hey, this is Fred David Van Hart, and I want to talk to everybody about the big documentary that's coming out, 350 Days After the Life of Wrestlers and the Things They Did. Hi, this is Fred the Hammer Valentine. You gotta go see 350 Days. That's right, 350 Days because I'm in it. A lot of other great wrestlers are in it. Big names, big stars. Talking about lives and times of wrestling and the main thing on the road. It's a great movie. Have lots of lessons, lots of lots of uh, road story, lots of funny story, but the best stories. Are you watching? It's great. It's about my life. Wrestling. 
lives years ago, what we used to go through, on the road, fighting the matches, fighting fans sometimes. You got the rock of Marty Jannetty here, we're rocking it, rolling the sprung and throwing the slamming and jamming, moving and grooving. Thank you, care of business and have a good time. And I want y'all to see what wrestling is really all about. You do have to, when you're rockers, fight for your right to party. But 350 days, watch the movies and what really goes on behind the scenes. And we're going to still be home rocking. Let me tell you, it's about 350 days on the road that the professional wrestlers had to travel and make a living. I think it'll be really interesting. And I'll show you all the reasons I have all these injuries. You need to check out this documentary. 350 days and get the taste of the blood of life. Pro wrestling, what I love and what I would die for. You check it out. Let's do a little thing and make it together. Come on! The journey. 350 days. Come see me, Wendy Richter, in 350 days. Life on the road as a professional wrestler. Hey, this is your dad's old road. You know who I'm talking about, the one and only, the sister, the doctor of style. I'm here to tell you, you need to do yourself a favor. Get out there, see the documentary, 350 days. I'm telling you, you need to see it. Don't miss it. It's a great, great story about the lives, not only of mine, but other people too. And each of us has our own individual story to tell of how we had a dream, chased our dream. Some had greater success than others, and I was a fortunate one to have a great career. You know, sometimes when you dig deep and you scratch the surface, you don't really see the whole true story. But if you dig real deep, you get really down there and look at it close, you'll find out what pro wrestling's all about. So I'm just gonna say, I hope all my fans will get a chance to watch this because it's going to be a great documentary. Hello wrestling fans, my name is Lanny Pavo. 350 days on the road and let me tell you what, I enjoyed every minute of it. This is Tito Santana, come see me in the movie 350 days. You will not regret it, you will see the pioneers, how we live. Arriba! All right, we are back with the Evan Ginsberg Show and performing live, Paul DeCoster, and this is his new CD, Universe, live set in studio. How you doing, everybody? Paul DeCoster. I, go, I perform as DeCoster, and I'm going to start off with a song called Albatross. Everybody's got a shadow Falls them around I pretend not to notice When I wonder why I'm down I see a horizon Just flying that way I could be on that flight If I didn't get in the way Dreams being achieved 
look beyond yourself Let's see you other people talking Your head is filled with what they say Your thoughts are sealed in your own coffee This line is it anyway They really have to ask This one's called The Spirit in Me. Yeah. Well, people see me walk the streets alone With the expression on my face is stone I got shades to hide my eyes I know how this broken screw denies Well, some have pity, some have scorn Give me the evil life of being born Presence in many spaces. Lots of people follow me around. Swear to God, I'm a publicity hound. They want a piece of what I've got inside. I am a cocky if we're taking stride. A lot of the songs that I do in this particular CD, here, I like to say, are looking both beyond and within. Beyond in the sense that we're looking at the universe and the um, uh, greater structure of the solar system and all that's beyond, and also within, and how that, what is beyond, can reflect what's within and vice versa. This particular song is inspired by the idea of an astronaut seeing Earth's orbit for the very first time in the flesh. After all that training, you know what training astronauts go through and whatnot. So this is um, from that perspective. The 
Another astronaut floating above the world is being swallowed all by my own two eyes. While all possible horizons appear condensed, the planet's bigger than I realized. Up here, trying to look way down, floating around, looking for my hometown. Through the clouds, dust, gas, it can't be found. Open your eyes, how much can you see? The universe is bigger than a country, how much can you see? If they cut my line, I'd be drifting as far as forever. Like a baby afloat on helplessly, trying to put my feet where I think they ought to be. Now the world is a stepping stone to the transcendental state of being all alone. Looking for my lost love As if I could see her from this far above She could be from anywhere down there As long as she's imaginary How much can you see? The universe is bigger than a country How much can you see? If they cut my line I'd be drifting as far as forever track. Now I'm going to do another song which relates to the stars. This is about wishing. It's about wishing in particular on a shooting star. Shooting star folks. Shooting 
star I wish you'd come down to earth Was that you up there? A bombshell bursting in air. My finger that pointed at you up there was a wig with a fading flame. I see you passing by like a shooting star. You convinced me people can fly With our wings erecting into the sky you in flight What good are you for if you won't land on me like a meteor I see you passing by like a shooting star I wish you'd come down to earth and be my girl. I see you passing by like a shooting star. I wish you'd come down to earth and be my and be my. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that. And thank you very much, Evan Ginsberg, for doing such a wonderful broadcast. And congratulations on your new studio. It looks gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Yeah. Um, one more? Yeah, please. Okay, great. So this is the last song on the album. And um, just to let you know, the personnel on the album are Rich Kulsor and Percussion, who hails from Forest Hills, Queens. And um, I hail from Forest Hills, Queens. Exactly. 70th, yeah. 70th Road, um, <laughs> just off of Queens Boulevard. <laughs> and... Um, on this particular track, as you hear it in the album, um, Denny Bonet, famous violinist who just played Carnegie Hall recently, um, she plays violin on this. And the producer of this is a woman named Denise Barbarita, and she's also the engineer. And this is a studio which she and her husband Rich co-owned together called Mono Lisa Studios, which is in Long Island City, Queens. So if you want, you or anybody that you know who's a recording artist, 
of any stripe and want to have Denise produce your album. She does a great job. In fact, I should just plug that she recently um, engineered a Grammy Award winning album for Best Children's Album by wow. Lucy Colantari called All the Sounds. She just won that this year. And so that's to her credit, and they're located at MonaLisaStudios.com. This is many ways to celebrate the holidays. My name is DeCoster. Beautiful back cover as well. So, uh, the Costa Universe 
And uh, you just heard a live set here at VillageConnectionRadio.com and Jim Savali at the helm, our engineer and owner. And uh, Paul, why uh, why Universe? Well, I don't know. Pull the pull mic up to you. Okay. How about this? Can you hear me now? Yeah. I don't know. I think it was just a time for me to release a new CD, which was a new chapter in my life. And I think that Universe, I'm actually looking beyond i'm actually looking to the future i'm looking out in a hopeful way and i'm just trying to basically see my life and the life of those around me in the grand scheme of things you know because i mean we are on planet earth and earth is just what one planet in the solar system and we are not the only solar system out there so i'm kind of putting out there as far as i can isn't it a little egotistical for uh, folk to think that there's no life outside of us? I mean, when we watch like the Kardashians and, you know, the, the, the garbage that we create, I'd like to think there's life somewhere else in this vast universe. Well, I think it has yet to be revealed. I think the um, upcoming age which we're in is going to tap into that even further because I know that there's people are still very much interested in exploring space. I mean, you have NASA still continues at a very strong Pace and you know China has a very strong space program. They just recently sent a probe to the dark side of the moon hmm. to um, do some research for a possible space station up there. And India has its own space program. Russia, of course, still has its space program. South Africa actually has a satellite up in space. So people, so space is very much in the mix regarding today's society. I mean, just logically, where there's water, there's life. So you, you would like to think somewhere there's some kind of life out there. Well, apparently, I think they've discovered a couple of things. They've discovered water on Mars. And even though Pluto, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson, is not a planet, it's actually a gigantic asteroid, they have found lakes on Pluto. So for something which is not a planet, it certainly has planetary traits. There you go. And... <laughs> Speaking of traits, as I was listening to your last song about the holidays, I'm picturing this on like every movie ever made in the future, you know, about Christmas or whatever the case. That should be a standard. That is so catchy. I really appreciate that. That actually is, I mean, it was a time when I didn't have any holiday song to speak of. And I thought, you know what? What if I actually wrote a holiday song um, regarding today's approach to the holidays in December? That it's not just simply about Christmas time, that it's about, you know, not just Hanukkah as well, but also Kwanzaa. And sometimes, you know, as the Muslim calendar progresses throughout the years, Ramadan does happen to fall on that time of the year. This year it's falling in May. But, you know, we have to consider the fact that there are other holidays that are being observed, not to mention the fact that there is winter solstice, for those of you who are pagan and recognize that. Yeah, I would think that song would work in any movie tv show commercial for any holiday i mean it's well, so catchy and so well done no, seriously well you know i mean i i hope you put that out there because i would love for that to be for people one of the things i really like aim for as a songwriter is for people to actually sing along and really kind of like get the melody in their head and something which they can kind of hum along as they're trying to spice up their day or just trying to reflect on their day and if one of the songs i've written falls into their soundtrack and helps them get through the day, then I've done my job as a songwriter, as have many others who, you know, compose with that intent in mind. And I find that that particular song, I wanted to speak to, you know, people honoring the holidays in their own little way. Some people get drunk. Some people don't want to drink at all. Sure. Some people want to, it's often, I mean, oftentimes we're spoon-fed a lot of the Christmas narrative, although now I think that as the age is changing um, and, you know, as the civilization we're in gets a little bit less Christian centered as we've come to know it, then we can appreciate the fact that we don't necessarily have to grab those sweet treats or, um, and I will say this, I do feel that there is such a thing as Santa Claus because like Christ consciousness, everybody Santa Claus, how does Santa Claus deliver all the presents around the world in one night? There's a Santa Claus in every family. There you go. <laughs> that's so, true. That's my justification for the belief in Santa Claus. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, if you're looking for a magical man falling down the chimney with a white beard, well, that's just one particular image of it. You know, I mean, there are many images of it. I like when um, stupid criminals get get stuck in chimneys trying to rob the house and they have to call the police. You ever, you ever hear those stories? 
Oh, um, well, you know, yes. I wouldn't be surprised. No, that's I really happened. Surprised. That's really happened. I never saw Home Alone. That didn't happen in that movie, did it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, they had a Home Alone Christmas. I think they made two other movies besides that. Yeah, it's like you're a pretty dumb criminal if you're uh, getting stuck in chimneys robbing houses. Well, criminals are criminals are just usually quick. I don't think they're necessarily the brightest bulbs in the shed. It really <laughs> That's depends. Right. That's mm-hmm. right. So uh, what do you consider some career highlights? A career highlight, I would say, is I got interviewed by WHUD over in Peekskill, New York. It's a station which is in the Hudson Valley, and there was a show called the Hudson Valley Artist Spotlight. I'm not from the Hudson Valley, but I perform there pretty regularly at places like Peekskill Coffee House. I played at um, Rock to Casbop in Saugerties, New York. I played over in Schenectady, New York. I'm going to be playing in Albany at the Savoy Tap Room on June 1st at 9 o'clock p.m., so since I'm there pretty regularly, I submitted some material to Andy Bale, who's one of the regular disc jockeys there, and he gave me an interview. Wow. And Great. it's on record, too. If you want to go to it, you just go to whud.com and look under Andy Bale and look under a Hudson Valley Artist Spotlight circa 2018. And sure enough, lo and behold, you see DeCoster, and for that it was Walking in the Sun. That was the previous CD. I think I actually was on the broadcast last year, and I gave you a copy of that. Well, this is pretty much... Um, the direction I would like to take my music into, something which is a little bit more of um, a spiritual nature. That's great. That's great. And tell us about um, some of the songwriters that have influenced you. I don't know where to begin. I don't know where to begin. Um, if you're talking about right off the top of my head, Todd Rundgren is a big influence. Oh, yeah. Because, Hello, it's me. Well, not just simply that, but also um, Can We Still Be Friends and also Hide Away. And he's also a brilliant producer and arranger. I mean, he might not necessarily be... Some people have mixed feelings about what he's like to work with, but I think he really genuinely inspires many people. He just recently did a Berkeley commencement address at Berkeley College of Music in Massachusetts. What do you think of Dilford and Tilbrook from Squeeze? Those are like perfect three-minute pop tunes. That You just named one of my influences right there. They're like, um, they're like the Beatles for the punk era. Yeah, great. Another major influence, I mean, a lot of influences I get are actually from British pop music, like XTC, who are very Beatles-influenced, but they have some brilliant songwriting. And a lot of my songwriting, I think that's pretty much like in the DNA. Also, the progressive group Rush, I listened to a lot of their stuff. But I also didn't just listen to that. You know, growing up, I listened to WABC, and they had a mix of both R&B, disco, and um, rock and roll. So they play Cheap Trick and Rush in one hand, and they play Teddy Pendergrass, and they play Dionne Warwick, and they play um, the Tramps Disco Inferno. Yeah. They play the Village People. Yeah, in the old they days, play, it wasn't as restricted. Um, you know, stations would play. I grew up on Frankie Crocker on mm-hmm. uh, WBLS, and uh, Frankie Crocker would play everything, everything. Well, I just recently uh, Facebook friended uh, Jimmy Fink, who used to be a disc jockey for WPLJ back when it was a rock station as it were and i remember it changing format over in 1982 but they still kept on as jim kerr did on a light fm station and a lot of the djs i grew up with are jim kerr carol miller jimmy fink tony pig mark coppola pat st john oh, yeah. um i mean that because i listened to plj a lot but you know every once in a while i would just get bored of all the hard rock because they play the same songs all these radio stations would play the same stuff that they were programmed to play so it changed the station. I'd listen to Cool and the Gang's Too Hot like on another station. And I like Cool and the Gang. I actually saw them live at an AIDS benefit back in 1995. They were great. There you go. I've yeah. seen them several times. I'm going to see Al Green next weekend. Um, yep, he never gets tired. I have um, tickets for uh, Zap. You know Zap? I don't, actually. Roger Troutman, um, Roger Troutman was the leader. He's gone mm-hmm. now. But a tremendous R&B act. And... Um, also known as Hendrix. Well, you know, I want to name some artists which I think I really enjoy these days. I like Rihanna. I do like Walk the Moon when I've heard of them. I like, um, who else do I like? I like H-E-R, Her. She's really good. Um, She's opening for Erica Badu. She, she is, is over on May 11th, but I'm not going to be able to be there. I'm uh, playing a music festival in Tacoma Park, Maryland on that day. Really? Wow. Yeah. So I'm getting around as far as festivals are concerned, and I intend to really tour pretty heavily with that CD. There you go. Um, I'm also playing at the Jersey Shore Festival on May 18th. That's going to be at a club called Santeria, which is over in Seaside Heights, New Jersey, the home of Bon Jovi, at 5.15 p.m. Um, I don't have the addresses of yet, but if you check my website, decostermusic.com, I'll have all the information up there. 
Any other social media or anything you'd like to plug? Um, yes. Um, you can reach me on Instagram at TigermanPCD. That's T-I-G-E-R capital P capital C capital D. And I love pictures there. You can catch me on Facebook at facebook.com slash no messing with spirit. And also on thecostermusic.com as well. So there's that. I have a Twitter account, but I don't usually pay too much attention to it. The one I pay most attention to is the Instagram because I like the idea of telling stories and pictures. There you go. And uh, we are honored to have you in studio. That was a beautiful set. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me here. You're always welcome. And bring some of your uh, musician friends the next time. Well, I see that there's enough space to have a percussionist in here. So the next time I do a showcase, I want to make sure he comes because he's right in Forest Hills. And I mean, if you like what you heard today, wait till you hear me with this guy. Rich Culser, he's a dynamite percussion player. In fact, he, be awesome. he actually played on that Lucy Kalantari um, children's CD, All the Sounds. He was one of the drummers, and he recently drummed for Roger Waters. Wow. Yeah, wow. So he's, he's, he's gotten around. There you go. And uh, I just want to remind everybody to check out 350 Days. Yours truly, the associate producer, Bret Hart, superstar Billy Graham. Check out our merchandise, 350 Days, the movie.com. And uh, I'm not getting naked. It's the uh, t shirt. Mm-hmm. And um, thank you, DeCosta Universe. Support thank you, Evan Ginsburg. Great independent music. Thank you for all the great guests we heard today. Oh, I learned a lot you. about television. That's right. That's right. Erica A watches more TV than any human being in the world. Nikolai White, wrestler. John Arezzi, wrestling historian. Can I say something? Sure, actually? absolutely. I'd like to see a movie where The Rock plays the magnificent Morocco. I love Morocco. Yeah. Morocco was great. But have, have you imagine him actually playing that, where he's like fighting his old his father, Rocky Johnson. Because I remember I was a big fan of Rocky Johnson growing up. Really, I was. I yeah. liked the because he had a very special move. He do. He was a gymnast, and what he would he was do was a boxer. He, he would take. Yeah, he was very. He was an all around yeah. athlete, and he just basically take you and you do like a little backflip yeah. right from the top of the uh, ropes. I think. I think Morocco was one of the all time greats, and not only was he a great wrestler, he had a- unbelievable charisma, and he was a great talker. Well, I mean, <laughs> I loved it when he um, would kind of like badmouth Rocky Johnson. He was pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah, Morocco was great. And uh, you're great. And uh, we just want to thank Jim Savali, as always, for the forum, Village Connection Radio. And there's very few shows that will mix wrestling, TV, and great music. So uh, thank Eclectic you, Eclectic is best, right? That's right. That's right. So, the Costa Universe. And where, where can they buy this? Well, right now, I'm going to be putting it available on Spotify very soon. I mean, you can see me at shows, and I will have it available. And I've got a special offer um, for about the price of $12. That CD will be available, and I will have as a free that I can, I can give for free the previous CD, which I made, which is Walking in the Sun. So you get two for the price of 12 There you go. There you go. So that should about do it, folks. This is the eclectic mix known as the Evan Ginsberg Show. We will not be on next week because there's a telethon at the station. Jim, why don't you tell us about that? Um, it's for Renee, Renee Marie Strokelock. It's her fifth annual telethon. Second one we're doing. Yeah, it's uh, to build awareness and to uh, help awareness. stroke victims. And uh, that's the, uh, all day next Sunday, all day. So... Uh, I will be back in May, folks, and uh, that should about do it. Thank you. Thank the you Costa very much. Costa Universe. Thank you very much, Evan. You got it. You got it. We'll see you next. We'll see you in May, folks. D.
idea of where I stand Na 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 na